Well, hello, and welcome to the studio of Sandra Quantro here in Roxbury. Um, I live in a town where we have so many old barns that the historians in the town uh, actually um, arranged financing for a, a book on our barns. Uh, it turns out we have more than 300 barns in this uh, village of Roxbury. And um, <clears throat> one of them is actually on my property. But what's wonderful to see in the book, there's wonderful photographs and um, beautiful depiction of the old wood and the way in which the barns were built. Um, so much that's really interesting and more than enough um, opportunity to go out and see different barns all around town and um, see how the doors and the windows and the eaves and everything are constructed. <clears throat> the, um, the doors uh, on this shed here that I'm putting in the painting are similar to the sliding door on my own barn, which is a bigger barn, but this is um, I wanted to have a small shed in this painting. Uh, the inspiration for this painting is uh, this photograph, which I took in Vermont when visiting my daughter's family. And um, there, I took many, many, many photos of the cows and spent days hanging out and looking at them and enjoying them so much. My own grandfather had these kind of cows um, and uh, was a dairy farmer and my father for a while was a dairy farmer so I was just totally drawn to these cows and this photo I liked a lot so I decided to use it for a painting and um, I thought that it needed an extra cow in it so I put that in and I liked the idea of a small shed because um, just the cows lying down and all that greenery um, just didn't seem to have enough interest uh, for me for the painting. So um, I did I did use the idea of the fence fencing in this um, in this uh, photograph made it a little bit different in terms of. Um, spacing and location and put the shed in and decided it would be a hay shed which is common in a number of dairy areas and uh, there'll be some depiction of hay. I started uh, to just put an indication of the lighting so there's a little bit of uh, soft yellow on the sun side. I'm thinking that there's a sun coming from the left and um, in this you know it was sort of midday and you really can't see any shadows in this. A uh, little tiny shadow there but very very little on the grasses. Um, it was sort of high noonday sun so there wasn't really any shadows even here. You don't see any shadows in the background. So, I, But I like the idea of having shadows in the painting. I think it adds so much to it. So it's a matter of deciding, well, where will the sun be in this particular painting? And, um, and where will the shadows be? So I decided I really like the idea of the sun being in the back here. And so I put some uh, soft yellows on the sun side, and um, I want I will be wanting to put some shadows on the roof, and also have the side of the barn that is being lit by the sun coming from that direction. Um, so I've made that very bright here so that I can remind myself how I want this done. The shed is um, positioned as most of the sheds in the area here are and, and are in New England. They're positioned, uh, the wood is on top of stone 
and um, that is so that the wood doesn't rot um, by sitting in the moisture. So it's quite common to see that there's something similar to a stone, stone wall foundation. Um, maybe dug into the ground a little bit, but that stone foundation enables the wood to sit on top of it and um, be um, safe from uh, rotting. There would probably have been, uh, you know, some of these posts, some of the key supporting posts would have been deep and dug into the ground. Um, but uh, but the, these boards here, these wouldn't be so strong and, and they wouldn't be dug into the ground. So that's the way that's laid out. So I have some stones here, uh, a few nice trees. Um, there weren't any trees in here, as you see, not here. They were over on the side, but I really liked the idea of some trees behind the cows and some shadows coming down, coming down like this. So the, to start this painting, basically just going to start with, um, I've already just done a little bit of the values of the shadows. So I'm gonna do a little bit of the um, showing the wood and how to approach doing the wood. And um, I've already done some soft glazes with just you can hear the rain you can hear the rain on the uh, on the metal here but I've, I've put some soft washes of of umber this is just um, raw umber here and it's a nice soft wood I'm putting it here and there I had put already a little bit of um, what's called a, a walnut color and mixed in with some Mars violet um, in some areas because I really here's a little bit of the Mars violet. I just wanted to have some violet on the shadow side. So what I'm going to do is now put in some of the detailing over these these washes. I did a little bit here, but let me show you how I'm doing it here. I won't do the whole thing on camera because it's a bit tedious to watch somebody do endlessly all these details. So let me just come in a little bit and um, show you that a little more closely. Here's some burnt, some burnt umber. Just putting in some of the marks between the boards. Normally we see some of these crevices between the boards. But we don't want to draw continuous lines. We just want to indicate that those shadows in the cracks between the boards are there. Okay. And then um, there'll be some boards that have um, a bit of a reddish A little bit of reddish color and I'm going to take a mixture of burnt sienna and, and transparent red oxide to put in a little bit of that reddish color here and there on some boards. Not every one but just some give show something of the richness of the boards, the rich colors. A 
I'll take a little Mars violet, which is a nice kind of brownish, brownish um, granulating violet. And I'll put a little bit of that in the same, with a little bit of that same mixture of transparent violet and just intensify some color on a few of these boards with the violet. And it's a little regular. We don't want it regular, but just here and there to indicate. And then we will go a little bit darker on some of the boards. Um, by going, I'll get a little Van Dyke brown, which is a little darker. And mix some of the Mars Violet with that. And show that some of the boards, some of the boards will have a very rotted look. You know, when they when they really get rotted looking and wet looking, um, they're a little more dark, and so we'll show some of that. Some of these boards are really very dark, with kind of being, you know, decomposing, and they would be a little more dark down on the bottom here. So I'm going to show that, that there's more of that. Decomposing wet wood down on the bottom. Okay. And then I, I have a, a board that goes as, becomes as sort of a, a board that is part of the support structure for the, the roof. It goes like this. And that's so it has uh, some dimension. It has, it's casting a little bit of a shadow. So I'm just showing that shadow and that, that board. And then the bottom side of the the bottom side of the the roof that is in shadow. But as it comes down toward the and where some light could be hitting it. Um, where some light could be hitting it, I'm going to leave that edge a little lighter than the rest. Let's put a little water in there. And then underneath that board, I'll go back to the um, colors I was using on the the other boards, this support board, had that be like that. When this dries a little bit, I'll put in a, a line to differentiate the two boards. Let's see if I can get one in now with, without it being too, it is a little bit wet for it to try to put in that, that mark. But I'll try to do it here. And then I'll probably have to come in and reinforce that a little bit. So that's pretty much it. Um, there's the the board that we can see and. Um, the side of the, the board, the roof, I'll just tone that yellow down with a little bit of umber. 
much approximate. Umber is a close color for the <coughs> for the boards in general because it's not too red and it's not too violet. It's just a nice neutral color for this kind of wood. And then down on the bottom here we'll see that these boards as they rotted a little bit it's very common to see that they aren't perfectly even okay so and that they're really most dark uh, down on the bottom and that they're not quite even so let's that they're rough here so let's show that and then underneath the um, the warts, I'm going to take a little bit of indigo, mix it with that brown. There's a space. There'll be spaces between the stones, the tops of the stones, and the bottom of the boards, and those will be very, very dark. It'll be black really, but for now I'll put it in indigo. And then I'll put some indigo between the stones, indicating the shadows between these stones. I'd already put a little bit of gray on the stones. So now I'm just indicating the shape of the stones by showing the dark color. I, I mixed together indigo and uh, Morris violet. But basically any dark. I mean the main thing the main thing in painting isn't so much the color that you choose as long as it's the right basic family. But it's getting the right value. So if I wanted to use a, a blue that was very dark I could use that, a blue mix with a brown, making it very dark. Again, I could do that. Um, just a, a violet. You know, as long as I've got the right value and it's somewhat harmonious with the other colors used in the painting, that's the key thing. Right now I'm putting in now just a little bit of straight indico, not mixing it with anything. Um, and putting that in some of the crevices so they're not all the same. So there's an indication. And then to just, um, I'm going to take a little bit of umber and give a little bit of shape to some of these stones. They had a slight, uh, they had a slight wash of gray to start, but now I'll give some shapes to them because the stones always have some shapes. I use some umber, I use some, I can use some of the indico and put in some of those mid-tones because we have the light tone on the stone already and um, then we had the very dark value between the stones and now we use a very mid value of almost any color, sometimes brown, could be a little brown and blue mixed together, could have a little violet in some of the stones, because every stone is a little bit different color, but we don't want to make them overly colorful, um, but just a slight amount of variation between the stones. Is this one a little more red? This one maybe down here a little more red? Just like we did with the boards, um, I like um, to have some variation. This one a little more blue. Use this one here a little more blue. So that's the beginning of the stones. We can leave that for now. There'll be more stones. Uh, then I'll uh, show you the beginning of the trees. The tree, uh, let's do one tree.
Okay, because I, again, I don't want to bore you with a whole lot of watching endless detail. I had already put some yellow in, so I'm going to leave that, that soft yellow in some places, and just draw some marks on the bark, show letting that soft yellow show through. And I'm using just umber right now. And let's put a little bit of um, transparent red in some places. You can see that. This is the transparent red is sometimes used by people instead of burnt sienna. It's very transparent, doesn't granulate. So if you want it to be a little stronger and a little more semi opaque and granulating. You can now, what I've just done is I'm bringing in a little bit of burnt sienna. And then as the tree transitions around to the shadow side, it gets a little darker. So I'm bringing in some plain umber, but concentrated, more concentrated than the first wash. I'm going around that tree. And then I want to go just a bit darker, so I'm going to go with um, the Van Dyke, which is the darkest brown. And on this side of the tree, I'll put in some lines of dark, and then along the whole edge that's away from the sun, I'm going to make it very dark. Uh, and a little bit of texture showing through, but this will always be some light and some texture, but there. So that's the way I'm approaching these trees. Then down on the bottom, um, I'll assume that as it gets down to the bottom of the tree, that it is darker. And that's for two reasons. Partly it might actually be darker at the bottom where it's oldest and has been weathered the most. But also, this is the way to um, ground the tree. And in the, and I'm gonna show some of the root of the tree, roots of the trees. This is the, a way to ground the tree and connect it to the earth by making it dark and having some of those roots show so that it's not floating in air this tree so that's how I'm going to do the trees okay now I'll just go back over here uh, to finish this roof here I want to just show you the finishing of this this roof here a little more edge because there is um there are um, what do we call that? Shingles. Shingles on the roof. And uh, so I just want to indicate that those are there. Okay. And then uh, the, all of this railing and everything for um, for the door that slides along an iron rail uh, that is protected by pieces of wood here. This, uh, that will be painted in. But that's the beginning um, of this, okay? And there will be grass on the ground. So I'll put the, put the shadows in a little bit later 
when all the grass is done. Um, but that's a, I think that's a start. So I'm going to, when I go off camera, I'm actually going to put in all these trees. <clears throat> but before I do that, I want to take uh, some blues and put in some blue sky behind the trees so that I don't have to worry about um, the trees uh, being in the way of putting in the sky. So I'm just going to take some very thin wash of cerulean yellow, I mean cerulean blue, and um, put that in. And I don't have to really worry about the covering the trees because, and I'll just leave a little bit of white, wispy white and some lighter colors here and there, as if there are some clouds. But I'm not going to draw, draw in clouds with this sky, and I'm not going to make it solid blue. just want a light wash with a slight indication that maybe there are some light, misty, wispy clouds in there. And that's, that's all on this one. Um, oh, there's some clump of something. <clears throat> And this is so light that I don't, I'm not worrying about um, covering some of those branches or some of that with the sky color. Okay, so that's, that's it for the sky color. And um, the, I'm not going to put the hillside color in because it's going to be There's a lot of green and different shades of green. So when I do the hillsides, I'll do that all. I'll do that all together after putting in the cows and finishing the shed. So my my approach to this painting is uh, to put in that sky, which is done, to finish the shed. And let me zoom out. So you can see better what I'm talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Just get that a little better there. So <clears throat> I'm going to finish the shed, put the hay in the shed, and uh, finish these trees. There are trees everywhere here small ones, larger ones, more small ones. And then, um, I'm going to put in the, the greenery and only after putting in the greenery and having the greenery and the sky completely dry, then I will put in these small thin calligraphic marks for all these branches and saplings, all these branches and things like that. And then over here, all these fence posts. So the, the process here is to do the shed, do the main trunks of the trees only. I've done the sky, then I'll do the greenery, then I'll put in the small fence posts and all the thin, narrow um, branches and saplings and twigs, okay? And this foreground I'm going to do last and it'll be done by painting the greenery around the cows and basically doing negative painting all around the cows and then doing the basic shading on the white 
not painting anything white, but the shading of any white areas. And the, I'll show you. So do the shading of any white areas, and then do the black um, markings of the cows, okay? So that's the sequence, and like I said, I'll do the shed and the big tree boughs um, off camera, all right? And then come back to do this area of greenery in here and the fence posts and the branches. See you later. Okay, well I've done the major trees and the shed and now can paint in the background and not worry about these trees. Um, I can paint over the background um, to do those trees and all these branches um, will be put in after the background is done. So we have a, a light cerulean blue uh, sky and these the um, Sunlight is coming from this side, so there will be some shadows on the roof and certainly shadows on the ground. But we'll just start with um, making some greens that would go with the background. And they won't be, they won't be so green as, as what we see in the photo. Uh, it um, is a little too yellow and too vibrant. Um, I really want the vibrancy to be in the cows and the shed. So we'll just tone all that down. And one of the ways that we'll do that is we'll take some, we'll take some hookers green, which is very bright. And I'll take some sap green, which is it's also pretty bright. I'm um, taking a look at the different greens and trying to decide which one to get. Um, here's an olive. It's not as vibrant. It really doesn't matter which one we use because what I'm going to do <clears throat> is tone it down with some transparent red. In fact, I can use them all. It doesn't really matter. What matters is what you do to it. And what I'm going to do to it is tone it down with some transparent red. Okay, and since we have a fair amount of transparent red in the uh, trees, that will go very nicely. I think um, what I'll do is start with that color for the mid-range mountains and then have it blued, blew it down for the more distant mountains. Okay, I'm using a, uh, right now I switched to a quarter inch uh, flat brush that is synthetic. It's a Taclon, um, it's called a Taclon synthetic mix. I'm just basically putting that, laying that in, and it's a fairly watery, as you can see, it's a fairly watery mixture. And uh, I've got several layers of hillsides, so this will just be that middle, that middle hill to start with. And it has a little bit of granulation in the color. So, and then some of it goes over here. I just want to carry it over there. It doesn't really matter. Um, I'm just doing it for where I want to see it be somewhat continuous. So, I'll put it in over here. Okay.
I'm going to soften that edge. Um, so, I don't want a hard edge there. I'll just dampen my brush and clean it and soften that edge. I will just do this to go up into that other mountain area, which is here. But that's not going to be the final color. I want something a little more blue. But this is a good start. Just a very watery transition area. And the mountains actually go up much higher um, because this is the, uh, these are the green mountains of um, Vermont and the ski slopes are very nearby. In fact, just a, a short ride to Killington Mountain and to Pico Mountain, um, which is one of the reasons my, my daughter's family all wanted to be there go skiing and snowboarding. Okay, so now I'm going to take I want to take a little bit of that cerulean blue that's in the sky and put a little bit of that cerulean blue in this green. Yeah, that's a nice that's a nice green. It's a good transition color. Yep. And so I'm just going to make it very watery since I've already got some color in there. I don't want it to be too intense. So I'll just put some of this in here in this second mountain. And since there is some color already there, um, I can let it be a little varied. So even though there is detail in the photograph, of the, you can see the, the detail of the individual trees and all of that. Um, they look like lots of little speckles. Uh, it's very... I'm going to carry some of that over here as if there's another one in the background. Very faded. Just very, very subtle. And I'm doing, going to do the same thing over here. Um, let's put another one in the background. Very subtle. And then I'll just uh, take my, wipe my brush and soften that edge there. So you can, so the viewer will see, gee, is that sky? Or is that another mountain? And that's nice. It's nice for it not to be too defined, I think. Just uh, enough to say, oh, there's something going on over there and the sense of perspective. Okay, I think that's probably enough for that. Now, in the foreground of these greens, um, it turns out, if I show it to you, there are some crops here, and there's a lot of foliage, of course. Um, I can put some of that foliage in, and I can put some of these, some of this pasture in, but I want to be careful not to overdo any detail, okay? So I'm just going to take the greens that I have, and uh, if you look at this green here, this is a more intense green. If I wanted to put some row of trees over here, I would just take a blue. I think I would take a cobalt blue, add it to this green. 
Let's see what I got here. Take a cobalt blue. It's a little more cool blue than the cerulean blue. It's too yellow. Let me take a little ultramarine blue. And that'll cool that down. Okay, that's a good one. And when I add uh, water, I'll get it to be the right uh, darkness. So I think I'm going to uh, switch from the flat brush now and go back to my pointed round because I'm going to um, want to give some uh, texture and shape to this row that's closer and so just indicate that yes there is there is um, there are trees here with shapes in this foreground and and I'm just going to indicate those in this way it's kind of a you know just doing a lot of random strokes here to make a row of trees. And usually at a row of trees, um, there'll be some sense of a dark area at the base, under the trees, and where there's some brush as it comes down to the um, to the edge of the pasture, what they call the the marginal edge in uh, in planning, you plan for the marginal edge. That marginal edge is um, where there's a lot of small brush, and it's a very important edge for habitat where a lot of the animals will come through the woods and uh, eat at the marginal edge. So I'm just going to now come in with um, a little bit of, of an indigo and add that to the blue down here to get an almost black. Okay, I'm going to put that under the edge because this is going to be the edge of the pasture. And uh, I, I like how it's going wet on wet into, wet into, bleeding into the tops of the trees here. And in some places I'll just make it a little more dark. Give some form to that. I just have to be careful of these trees here. I don't want to cover them. Now if I water some of that, that intense blue, which is a nice blue, down, I might have some little bit of, of behind us. Water some of that down. It's the same color that way with the indigo in it, but indicating some foliage behind this row of foliage. And if I water it down a little bit more and mix it with the other green that we'd already made, um, I might get a little bit of shadow in this mountain range here. And that would harmonize with the color below.
That's probably enough detail. Anything too much more than that, and it'll be a distraction. So um, then what we see a little bit below that edge is, I'll go back to my, my browns. Um, we'll usually see some brushes. There'll be some trunks and trunk brush. Okay. So I just put some burnt sienna at the base to indicate the kind of brush that one might see. And some brushes and dried grasses and things like that at the base of those trees. So I'm going to do that and bring that down a little bit in a varied way. And then what we have is a rather bright pasture. Um, I don't want too, too bright a green, but um, so... If I put a little bit of hooker's green in with this bluish color, I think that's might maybe too much. A little bit of olive green too in there. Nope, still too bright. I'll take um I'll take some raw sienna, which is a very yellowish color, and tone that down. I want it to be a green pasture, but I don't want it to look too, I don't want it look, to look like emeralds, even though it does in reality look like emeralds. <laughs> it's a nice, beautiful, um, bright green. But let me tone that down so that it's more of an olive green, and I did that by using the, the um, raw sienna. I could have also used yellow ochre. <clears throat> okay, so it's a little darker up near the um, woodland. The woodland that the oops. Gotta wipe that too much water on the brush. And, yeah, and just let it be a little varied here and there. Again, I'm, I'm avoiding those um, trees. I don't want to cover them over with the green. I could, but then I'd have to make them very dark to cover over. So I'm just going on here now. <clears throat> and I'm now avoiding the fence posts. But it doesn't matter about the wire. I can paint over the color for the wire but I'd like to avoid the fence bows. And the tree there. It doesn't have to be perfect in terms of avoiding it, but for the most part I want those, I don't want those fence bows to have too much green tone in them. Okay. We'll take a little bit of that over here and just drop that down over here. I think that's enough uh, detail for the background. Now, in terms of the foreground, we'll use that same green. Um, but bring a little more of the blue into that green that we were just using and bring it forward here. It can be a little more vibrant in the foreground. And I'm going to make the wash very light because I'm going to come in with uh, 
scrumbling, uh, scumbling of um, more color. I'm going to lay in this foreground area. I'm going to lay on um, grassy shapes. And I'm glad I put in a sense of shadow underneath the cows here. So, and shadows from the trees so that I don't have to, by doing that ahead of time, with a sort of brownish violet color. I don't have to worry so much about um, changing the color to make shadow at this point. And it helps always remind me, by putting it in early like that, I mean, I can always create better shadows later. I just, there, yeah, drop some color there that I didn't, shouldn't have. You know, I can always put a little darker color in these shadows, but at least I'll be remembering where they are, the main shadows. I've still got more work to do on these rocks. Um, well, let's just lay in this, this grassy area around the cows and around the building. And inside the building, that'll be dirt. I could have used a bigger brush uh, here. That might have been. But it doesn't really matter. I, you know, I just... I want to just have some control so the little brush is nice because I can get around these um, areas of the cow that I want to make sure I don't get any color on them because some of those areas are going to wh remain white and some of those stones are going to have white highlights on them. And um, so I just want to be careful to be able to get into these little corners like under the neck of this cow and under the chin of this cow here. There. And as I go down here, I put a little, I'll make this a little bit darker in the front in the foreground. Using the same color, just a little more color. A little less water. Okay, I think that's okay for now. It's okay to leave a little bit of, you don't have to cover every bit of the paper. It's okay to leave some white here and there. leave my options open. I can always add more color later. Okay. So, now this thing needs to dry and the paper needs to settle back down to being flat. And then we'll come back in and do all the calligraphic marks of the branches and uh, detail the rocks and put in the fence posts and put in these trees here. And the last part will be the cows, but the cows be fairly, fairly fast and easy because they're white cows and uh, white cows with black stripes. So basically we just um, paint in some shadows in the cows, like here in this part here, there's some shadow. Under the neck, there'll be some shadow. So, so make some shadow color for the cow, and um, and then and then put in the uh, the black uh, markings of the cow, and then some scrumbling. I'll show you some scrumbling area. I'll do some areas, but I won't go through every detail. And I'll show you how I'm doing. Going to do the calligraphic marks on the main trees. 
but I won't do every single branch on on the video because it's uh, it just takes time and you don't need to you just need to see how how it's done but uh, not every single stroke okay I love I love how this brown is mixing a little bit with the green and making some variation up here in these in these trees it's very nice sometimes the paint just does its own thing and um, good so we'll come back to this I'll see you in a bit later okay <clears throat> the um, the buckling of the green is still not uh, reduced enough to to work on the calligraphic marks but um, I thought I would just create some hay bales back here. Um, I don't have a reference photo for hay bales, but I um, look at them every day since I have three horses and uh, <laughs> um, just there and the way that they're stacked <clears throat> is just one on top of another, you know, and so I'm not going to put in, uh, it, there's no reason to fuss about the hay bales. They're all a little bit uh, different. They usually stack them so that some are going one way and um, others are going the other way and that way they're a little more secure. So I'm just going to show them and then there'll be an, another another row back here. And they'll be stacked up pretty high. <clears throat> and some parts are a little bit uneven. Okay, so and then there's the um, so just put a little bit of uh, different color. That color was uh, an, an ochre or a raw sienna, either one. And I'll just take a little bit of um, burnt sienna and mix it with some ochre and give a little bit of definition to some of these. Another a little bit more detail on the spaces between them, where they might be a little darker between them. But generally, they're pretty organized. The, the hay bales are always stacked in a very nice, organized way um, so that they don't fall over. And so, some going one way, some going the other way, making a nice set of <clears throat> and then a little bit of sometimes where they're they're on their side they're. They've got a little bit of a, a tie, and oftentimes it's a blue tie, so I'll just put in some of those, a few of those ties. And then, um, and then have some messy yellow. Uh, as if the hay is kind of escaping, you know, and bursting from the bale, which is often the case too, just to give a little bit of texture and, I mean, depends on, 
there's some green in the hay bales. I mean, the, I mean, what you want is a bale that has a fair amount of of green in it, but the cows go for a little more drier hay. But let's put a little bit of green in the bales too. some dark around them to fill in the empty space. In the dark there in that shed. I'm using a little Van Dyke brown for that, very concentrated. And then uh, some of that ground will also be in the in the hay shed. That would be just earth that back there. But they might be stacking it up on some wood or something, but it would be earth. Just dry earth. Maybe some pallets nowadays underneath something. But anyway, we'll just show it like that. Make some variation. But just to indicate that that's a that this is a, is a hay shed. Since there'd be a lot of walking in and out of there, that probably will be some earth there too, outside and not completely grassy there. But for now, let's uh, we'll think about how to make the transition from the grassy areas into the Shed. But that also is going to be in shadow, so we already had uh, some shadow shown there, so I haven't quite worked out the color of the shadow. It'll be a little more bluish than that. But anyway, there's the beginning of that. Okay. Um, we've got enough, enough drawing going on now over there to do some calligraphic marks over there. So let's, let's just do them. I'll be using my browns and, um, some, a rigger, a rigger brush. Uh, a narrow rigger. Yeah. So use this, this small uh, pointed round Escoda synthetic, and this is a zero rigger. So let's just start those trees over there. Now that we have the, just use any dark brown to put in those small. Not too medium brown. Can be um, a raw. Can be uh, a burnt umber. This is a burnt umber. I can mix it with a little bit of the yellow ochre in places, but basically just putting in these young, these young trees trunks of them. I had already put some soft yellow there. 
since it's this dry. So I can use that same burnt umber, a little darker, to put in the fence posts. And I'll put them in darker on one side and then lighter on the sun side. Okay, so I'll put in, I'll add a little bit of um, ochre or raw sienna to that burnt umber for the sun side. Okay, like that. Any, any more yellowed, lighter color will do. I have a fence post over here too. Okay, I'm going to leave them for a minute because they need to dry a little bit to, in order to put some shadow in. I'm going to get a little darker color here on this shadow side of this tree. These two trees. Okay. And some bark here. Some branches, rather. Shadow side. Now I'll put in a little shadow. It's still too dark, but I'll put in a little shadow on these fence posts on the shadow side, a little more dark. And in a few of them, some texture. I'll put a little dark on this one over here. Okay. And on the top of the posts, and some have a little bit of a mark. Some of them have the more. But some, you know, just showing the tops of the posts. Okay. And then here, connecting this tree a little bit better to the ground. And I'd already put in most of the um, major branches up here. So now I'm just going to take the rigger and do a few calligraphic marks for the branches, okay? And make some, make a nice dark, dark, dark mixture of Van Dyke Brown because the branches tend to be darker and maybe a little bit of, maybe a little bit of burnt sienna. So let me show you that. I've got a Van Dyke Brown and some burnt sienna. That's a nice color there, I think, for most of the branches. Some of them will be a little darker, but let's start with that. And come over here and just start at the, the main branch and just Now these branches are going to have some leaves on them, but I'll put them in later. Right now I'll just, because there always are quite a few, actually there are quite a few, since trees that have their branches without leaves and broken. So there'll always be some branches without leaves and some with leaves, but I'm just going to put in some of the branches. There'll always be some branches covered up with leaves and we won't see them, but I want to have enough branches in so with your rigor you can get some very nice lines and then lift it at the end to come out and lift it a little bit and that'll make that nice point. Let's 
fact, the more that you can be a bit loose about it, the better. As one gets older and your hands are a little bit more shaky, it's a, it's a little harder, but still just um, try to relax about it and and do the best you can. Okay, and then what we've got here is a bunch of saplings. Uh, again, the rigor is really quite nice for this, showing the the saplings and the and the and the dry brush that comes up on the edge around the fences. There'll always be some um, some dry branches and things around these fences. One of the things in, that you don't have in a farm is you don't have a lot people running around weed whacking every little thing so that it's also perfect. Instead you have a lot of old you always have a lot of old um, plants that's still standing. So I'm just putting in some of that. Okay, and basically what I'm going to do is go in now on for the rest of these and do more of those marks and then we'll come back and address the um, the foreground grasses and the rocks and the shadows a bit better but we'll let this all completely dry uh, for now but that's an, enough uh, indication of the branch work I can go back in and do just a very, very dark in a few places. And instead of, you know, that was a sort of a medium value. Now I can come in with the same rigor and do a few branches or parts of some branches. A little darker. And this is just um, so you can do as much detail as you want. I can do some of these, the bottoms of some of these saplings a little darker, the bottoms of the trunk a little darker. Um, this is just taking the pure Van Dyke brown without any burnt sienna mixed in, making it a little darker. So the main thing is to have a little variation, but it's not like, I'm not doing realism here, so I'm not, um, I just want to indicate what's going on out there and not uh, do every little blade of grass and every little um, feature of the bark of the tree, but just enough variation that the viewer will feel like they, that it might be an impression of something real. A little bit of marks, a little darker here on some of this with the rigor. Here you can have also a little bit of squiggly marks to indicate some brush in there in that area of burnt sienna that we put in. This is just to create the impression of the, some more detail with the darker brown. Some trunks back there, and some little brush back there. But not anything continuous and too overt. 
I need this line with the rigor to make the hip joint a little better on the roof. Okay. All right. We'll come back when this is completely flat and dry. Okay, well I still have quite a lot of um, branches to do here, but the hay is, uh, the hay is done as we, we talked about before and things are drying up here. So I, I decided to put a little bit of the browns, any of the browns, the dark browns, into the green um, because I want to get some shadow color um, on this side of the the shed. So I want it to be a greenish brown shadow color since it's basically a shadow on the green, on the green grass. So I want to get some of that color in before I do anything else and see how that works, but I think it's going to work pretty well. I'm not doing it as a wash, but I'm leaving some, some spaces in there because uh, there will be quite a lot of variation as it is um, grass that they're lying on. And I put some on this side of the building, which I think is working out well because that's in shadow. And all this is in shadow from the building. And then there's some shadows from the trees. I wanted to get this in earlier rather than later so that I could really see the the value contrast and how it's developing. So there'll be some grasses among this the dirt here. Uh, there's dirt going into the barn where people have been walking. But still, it's mostly grass. And this is part of that shadow. <clears throat> but um, the shadow kind of ends over here because the light is coming from the left. So it's just to the right of this tree, but not, um, not behind the tree. I'm deliberately using a small brush because I want to leave some little light spaces of speckling between sort of the grass and then I'll put in some uh, grassy kind of shapes but I just uh, want to get the base color that will go under the um, some of the more textured shapes that will be coming in later. So if the light is coming this way, the idea is that this would be the area of shadow. And the same, <clears throat> the same would go under the cows and uh, the cows would be casting a shadow also of the same color. And I already had a slightly violet light shadow earlier 
and this will just go right over that and um, so this is the shadow for the cow yeah because it just helps when you're painting to have a sense of how the values are playing out even though I'm not ready to do detail any detailing on the grass and it will all be a, a bit darker in the foreground but having a little undercoating since we're using transparent watercolor this will show through anything we put above and then we also have um, this, there's this tree comes this way and then there's also the other one that is coming out the other way. So that also will come here, be a shadow of that part of the tree. And where the two shadows combine, the shadow of the cow and the shadow of the tree, it will be darker. And of course it's quite dark right at the base of the cow, where no light, where the cow's body is really blocking the light entirely. And then there are these small shadows from the fence posts and this trees over here. And the grasses that are there. Okay. I just think that helps to scope out things a little bit better. The base of the rocks, the shadow is strong here. And of course strongest right here, close to the building where no light is getting through. So there's some shadow on these stones as well. And I had already put some color, some brown and some gray in, in the stones, so I'll just put a little more shadow on them. That's good. I think that'll be all right. There's still all this tree stuff to do and then there'll be foreground trying to show some grasses without getting carried away with detail. That shadow for the tree has to continue. And this one here has to continue. Nice long shadow. And that tree is curved, so therefore that shadow is showing as curved. There's also a smaller one, a thinner one, that is also a bit bent, and so we'll show that. This one has a little separation here too. That too. And the tree has got a number of. It's actually two trees. You can either see it as two trees or one tree with lots of parts. But, um,
I'm going to make that a little darker near the tree. Just plays a little better, I think. And at the base of these, this vegetation, the base of the fence post there, the fence here, and the base here too. That's enough fiddling with that. And um, so I'll come back after I have completed these branches, okay? And we'll put some, some bits of greenery on them. And um, the last thing I'm going to do is the wire on the fence because basically I have to be completely finished with everything behind that before putting the wire. Now I want you to see that I did put a little bit of a glaze of red oxide within the green in order to just differentiate that far mountain there as being a little further away by giving it a slightly violet tone. The same over here. I'll do the same over here. Slightly violet tone over there. And also to just separate one hill from another. And by changing the color and making it a little more a little more violet it automatically is seen as further away. So just a small amount of rosy glaze over the green changes that and makes it a little more distant. Okay. Well, we're making progress, I hope. Um, we'll, we'll come back after um, after all the branches are done. Um, as the paint was drying, I never did, still haven't gotten to the um, to the branches. I've zoomed in a little here because I wanted to show you that as the the greens, the green washes dried, they were really so very light that um, they aren't, uh, they just don't have enough intensity of color. So I'm going to take a dry brush, that quarter inch flat dry brush. I could go with a bigger one, but this one's good for making sure that <clears throat> this will work. I'm just going to go with a dry brush and a little bit of darker green that I've made from various mixtures of colors with some blues. And um, put a little more sap in there. That's a little, that's a kind of yellowish green mixing it in there with the blue. Um, because I felt like some of these colors need a little bit more intensity and so rather than just put on another wash I'm putting on some dry brush and just taking my brush and taking some of the paint off making sure it's got a little bit of dryness to it and um, putting some texture in here now as long as I'm going to be doing grass I can start to put some vertical texture too. I just need a little bit more color in here. Um, it's so pale. It dried so that it almost looks like an off-white. But that's watercolor. It often dries to about half the intensity. And the more transparent you've made it, the, the lighter it will dry. So, um, 
So I'm just putting some more texture and what I needed was more color, but I figured, well, as long as I'm putting more color, let's go for a little more texture in there too, since uh, this is going to be the foreground. And um, and I can put it in, in various directions here, just like grass would, would grow. Sometimes it's best to have your brush just follow the direction of growth or at least um, in the same direction of the object. So if it's a vertical object like grass, then maybe make it a little more vertical. So I'm putting in that texture here. I'm also going to do the same with a little bit of Hansi cadmium yellow or Hansi yellow. In fact, I'm, I'm using a Hansi yellow because it's more transparent than the cadmium, but it's a um, considered a good replacement for cadmium if you don't want to have any paints with metals, toxic metals on your palette. And the Hansi yellow is in the same color range but also more transparent. So a little more water in that. Um, this is the Ahanzi Yellow Deep. So, so again, I'll, I'll just make sure that my brush is dry enough. And as I move to the foreground, the grasses become less blue and have a little more yellow in them. There's some more green putting some more of that green in um, with the yellow as I move forward. And this isn't the end of the whole grass situation, but I just wanted you to see how I'm going to approach it with a variety of textures and um, different colors, almost like the old um, I can take some of this cobalt turquoise also, um, just a nice color, and put a little bit of that for just for diversity. I can put a little bit of that here and there. In the end, as you stand back, it will all blend together, just like the Impressionist paintings and Pointillist paintings do. And not all of it has to be done this way. Um, you can have it varied with some of the background. Being more of a wash, because you wouldn't really be seeing so much texture back there. And some of it being less textured. You don't want everything textured. So here I'm putting a little more, a little less texture as I move away from the focal point. Um, I want less emphasis there. I don't want the eye to be drawn as much over here on the edges. So, so I might add just a little more water and use the flat, flat brush, but it'll be less textured. Put a little bit of um, yellow ochre over here by the where the dirt is and where these grasses might be a bit more dried on. I'm 
going to make this um, a very early summer or late spring kind of season because um, I do want I don't want the trees to be heavily laden with leaves, so they'll they'll have. The grass will be green, but the leaves will still be sparse. That's just because I'm not wanting the leaves to just totally cover up that view of the hillside, of the sky. So I'm varying this with a little bit of uh, yellow, a little bit of ochre, um, a few varieties of green, a little bit of blue, until I feel like I get closer to a feeling of, uh, of grass mixtures, colors. Um, there still would be some highlights in that grass. And I also I'm putting a little bit of uh, texture here and there in the hillside, a little bit of color here and there in the hillside. My palette here. So that's the process on that, and I'll finish that. And I still have branches to finish, and um, I think the stones are almost finished. But I'm going to put a little bit more textured color with the raw umber here in the in the dirt. some little more browns up here in the stones. They're just a little too light still. I'm building up the color because the, it, it always dries lighter and I prefer to take my time building it up rather than having trouble that it's over done and has no transparency at all. So again, this is a flat dry brush here and there. And that works well with rocks, the dry brush does, because they had that grain, they made that grainy look. I could even go over the the wood a little bit with um with the dry brush. <clears throat> I don't want to overdo it, but let me go over it a little bit with the burnt some of the wood with burnt sienna, so you can see what I mean. A little bit of burnt sienna. Just intensify that color on that door a little bit. It's kind of pale compared to the others. And just a little bit of speckling on, on the bark of the trees so that they're not just flat looking. More speckling.
Two little bits of bark. Okay, I'll leave this for a while um, and come back to it once I'm ready for the cows. Hi. I have finished finally the calligraphic marks um, for the branches, the trees, mostly using a rigger, um, using some raw umber in some places, sometimes mixed with some burnt sienna in other places, some Van Dyke brown, or some of these dark colors. And then a little bit of accent of black along some of the some of the um, trees on the shadow side, and some intense black in some of the shadow areas under the rocks. Also a little bit of um, marks of black um, because it's um, on the shadow side of some of the tall grasses. In terms of the um, the grass, <clears throat> this is just a, a lot of dry brush uh, with green and I th was thinking that I would do some marks on that but I'm going to work first on the cows um, using Based on the reference photo that I took and the some of the pictures that I that I took, instead of the usual shadow colors on the cow, on the white parts of the cow, um, there is a bit of a soft uh, glow of uh, something like a. It's a bit like a maple's yellow, actually. So I think that um, the best thing would be to actually use some maple's yellow because I think the color is closest to that. I just found my tube of maple's yellow. That's a Hansa. It's a, a very, very warm, almost buttery uh, glow. The other possibility is to use a Jean, Jean, J A U N E, Jean Briant, um, number one, which is also a very soft uh, color, a bit like a yellow. So I want to just take a small brush, a small brush um, that's around a size, a small round, size two or, or three, and um, take some of that <coughs> soft Naples yellow and um, I'm actually going to tone it down with a tiny bit of Chinese white because even though it's one of the lightest and warmest yellows in the palette, it's still a little bit darker than what I want to see here for the cow. So in the shadow, in some of the shadow areas near the udder, um, it's this soft buttery yellow. So by uh, both the Naples yellow and the white are, are semi-transparent. 
They're both in the same family in terms of transparency. Um, so they're slightly opaque. But with enough water, um, they're still transparent enough <clears throat> for this to feel like watercolor. The tail of, of, of this white, even though it's a white tail, will look also creamy. Um, it tends to get a bit dirty. Um, so it would be a bit creamy. And parts of the um, foot will get a bit creamy. I don't want to overdo it, but that color is very, you know, on the underside of the cow is very um, yellowish in tone. So I'm going to do the same thing with the um, the first cow in the areas of the yellow near the base. I'm going to put that creamy that creamy color. So it's an off-white, I would say, a bit of an off-white. I see that the green is kind of blending into that, so I'll have to separate them a little bit. Put in a little more white here to help define that leg and remove some of that bleeding that's going on there much water in the mix. So it's reconstituted a bit of the green. I can fix that later. And then also around the muzzle of the cow there'll be some of that, some of that creamy white. And this cow here whose face is, is white. Um, this cow here has a little bit of white under its throat. <clears throat> so, and then the one in the background, um, I'm going to say it has some white on its face uh, around the chin and around the cheeks, but it also has quite a bit of dark on its body. So I have some white here on the shoulder and here's some white here. Okay, so that's the beginning of um, some slight color variation there for this, for this cow. I'm going to, now I'm just going to use the Naples yellow directly in a few places. To blend in and accent the yellow in some of the deeper areas with a little more shadow. Now, <clears throat> I still need to have some shadow colors, some normal shadow colors on the cow and not just um, the, uh, the soft yellow. Oh, I see another area where I need that, um, that Naples yellow on the ridge of the cow. where the bone, the bone actually is uh, very um, strong and the, the skin kind of hangs down in this area from the spine. So I'm going to put a little bit of that soft Naples yellow in that area. 
other parts of the cow I'm going to have, leave them. Um, there's also the same on the other one near the ridge in this area here. So this white has a color to it. Um, very subtle. But I do think that I'm, I think that it'll help to define the cow a little better by being true to the colors that are there. So the other thing that I want to do is um, create a little bit of shadow using some cobalt blue. very cool, very transparent blue, um, a very medium blue, not too dark, and, and not granulating. So a good one for using for shadow. And I, I just want to use that a little tiny bit to help define <coughs> a few places like the um, where the cow is a get has some really shadow areas around its leg and um, where the shadow is turning down into the crevice of the leg. Put a little bit of just a small amount of shadow in some areas. But I'm going to have to avoid putting it in the areas where I have the yellow, otherwise it'll turn green. I don't want that, so I'm just lightly putting it in a few locations, like under the chin here. Too many places where I can do that, but just a few. Okay. So for the most part, maybe on this fella's face a little bit in the area that shows his his structure of his face and his little chin. Okay. I can put some around the the ear here, which is uh, to help define the ear. In the shape of the head. I'll do a little bit more later, but right now that I'll do a little bit more with negative painting too. here on the rear end. And uh, this is just the beginning. I want to go very carefully and not overdo this at all. With these. I'll put a little bit on the, to define the edges of the tail. Because it's, I don't want the tail to have, the tail is white, it's not black. So it just needs a little shadow on it here and there to show the edges, show some of the hairs.
do that. So I think that we are beginning to see some shadow, but not too much, hopefully. Okay, so then the next thing is to actually paint the black um, of the whore, of the cow, and um, and that's pretty. And it's really a black. It's not a blue black. So I'm going to just use the color black. It's an ivory black. And ivory black is a very transparent black. So if I have enough water in the mix in some areas, it'll be lighter. And in other areas, it'll be darker. And I'm going to mix a little Payne's Gray with that. So it makes it a little nicer tone. So, I've got black hair on the head, and I'm going to just put in this, this first bit of black. In a, in a kind of medium amount of water. And so I don't want it to be too dark. So it's a, a bit transparent. Leave a little bit of a highlight around the ear. Like I said, I'm making this fairly light. My drawing doesn't exactly follow the markings on the cow. Um, this is a Vermont dairy cow. Spent a lot of time watching them and when they came went out to pasture and came in from pasture and and this was um when they're sitting like this here they were waiting patiently near the fence to come in and be milked And they know their schedule. Uh, animals all kind of get in, like to get into a routine, but especially um, milk cows do, because their udders get so full, and um, that has to be expressed. Otherwise, it can be painful. 
So when they're in that condition and they just go to the fence and wait for the farmer to come and um, walk them, open the gate and walk them into the barn and do the milking. These cows were milked twice a day and um, they were, they go into the Cabot, uh, Vermont milk company for processing. The milk does. And this, uh, this is a small farm, about 300 acres and a nice collection of cows. So you can see the pattern beginning to emerge and I really don't need to do anything more with that white. Um, except to put in the black markings that will begin to define the shape of the, the cow. So I have some more. I can really no longer see my pencil lines. Um, they've gotten lost a bit, but it's all right. it doesn't matter. Uh, every cow is different, so it's not like these are a set that the, that the marks have to be in one place and not in other places. So the main thing is to get them on and then I'll go back in and reinforce the darkness of the black in some places. So now what I'm going to do is just drop in some darker black, but leave some edges a little lighter. Just have some by dropping it in, not making it too solid, but having it have a little bit of Even, even though the cow has very defined, sharp edges, I think from the purpose of painting the cow, it's better not to overdo that pattern, but to just have some softness to it here and there. So the first layer that I put down was a fairly thin wash of Payne's gray and ivory black. And now I'm, I'm putting in primarily the ivory black in here and there. I'm mostly covering, but leaving some edges a little softer and um, since these are transparent colors, then they will show through. The 
you know, I could have just put in a, a dark layer of color, but I, by doing my brush strokes the way I'm doing, some of the color is a little bit lighter than others, and I think that the gradation of color, the variation of the color, is, uh, works better for the painting. So I'm just going to show you this, this process. I don't need to do all three cows on the video because it will be a little bit boring. Just take, do enough so that we have a sense of it. Now I want to define that ear over there pretty well. And then there's another ear here. So I want to leave a little bit of light color without making it all dark so that there's a sense of the ear being defined. So I'm just going to use some water in there to spread the color a little bit and then come back in with the very dark black and define under the chin. Now we had some white under the chin. So I'm going to leave that, but I'm going to put some dark boundary defining things under the chin. And um, also we have a very dark eye here. I'll show that. Now on the photo you can't see the eye or any of those features at all because they were all just a, one bit of dark. But I think it works better to have a sense of where the noses are and where the eye is and where the ear is. Okay, so that's probably enough for now. We can come in and do a little more detail later, but it's probably okay for now. Gives you just a sense of the, the cow. And if we do a little bit of um, negative painting with some of this cascade green that I used for dry brush, a little bit of that cascade green around the edges of the cow, then it helps to do the negative painting of the shadow. I don't want to outline it, but I want to do enough negative painting of the shadow on the shadow side. So I'm going to do a little bit of strokes here and there, and that helps to define the cow a little better too. Put some over here too. Defines the, the tail a little better. And then up above, um, it won't be quite as dark. I'll take some of the sap green, mix it with the cascade, and a little bit of cerulean blue. You get that bluish green, medium tone green over here. I'll put that in above the cow so that 
Again, that's negative painting so that we can better see the, uh, the shape of the cow. So I'll just put a little bit more of that. Even though there's dry brush there, and I'll just go over that with a little bit of this color in order to make sure that we really define the boundaries of that cow. Okay, so that's pretty much how I'm going to do that. Um, I can come in with very, very dark black in a few places, like, like down here, to intensely show the color. A little bit here under the chin, where it's darker. Show the color a little bit more clearly there. Make it a little bit very dark there. But I don't want to make everything on this cow very, very dark. I've just some areas a little more dark than others. Like that. Okay. I think that in some of that center black a little more dark. But not everywhere. Partly it's even though the, the animal is definitely very black where it has its spots. The light will be hitting it in some ways and reflecting on it that so that it shines and it has some variation. I'm going to make this chin and shape of the face a little more strong by putting in some black to shape it a little better. Just enough difference to show a nostril. It's not super defined. The, this one here with the white face will have it a little more defined. Okay. We'll leave some of these a little lighter back here. And this is, I'm using kind of dry brush right now to put some of this extra black in here and there. Okay. For now, I think that's, that's okay. And the other two will be done in the same way. Um, I'm not convinced that I'm going to put more detail on the grasses. But I am going to put some leaves on the trees. So I'll show you that. I'm, I'm going to assume that even though we have lots of grass, that the leaves on the trees are going to be like spring leaves. So it, they're not going to be a huge number of them. They're going to be kind of more sparse. So I'm not going to fill, I'm just going to put um, little bits of leaves like that with a color that is I'm mixing a bit of olive green and a bit of the cascade green and a bit of hooker's green and a little bit of cerulean blue until I get a kind of green that is Looks like young leaves, but not isn't too bright green. Uh, young leaves are a little more bright, but that's all right. I'm just going to sparsely indicate these leaves, and in some places do them like a mass of leaves with some dots of color in the mass. You see, just like that but in other cases, just little bits of leaves. So that process takes a little time, just indicating with the point of the, the brush. 
and every now and then a little bit of extra color in the like a group of leaves so just making a shape with the brush and in other cases just dots of leaves so that's the way I'm going to do that um, and that will just take a little time to do but so I don't need to do that all in the video okay but I'll come back and show you how it's how it's progressing we'll do an interim stage I'll show you so I'll do a little bit more watery wash in some areas like here a little watery wash and then drop in a little more uh, darker color here and there in that wash So it's a matter of just mixing a color that you feel comfortable with. I, I think it should have either a little bit of blue or a little bit of burnt sienna or ochre in it. Something that will tone it down from any of the greens in your palette. Make it the green that I'm using here has some of this dark cascade and some of the Cerulean blue and some of the um, hooker's green and I've just mixed them together until I get a nice little bluish green that I like but I might also um, at some point have some of the leaves be a little toned down by adding some burnt sienna like that okay so they don't they shouldn't all necessarily be the same So <clears throat> just mix your colors <clears throat> and, um, and and just carefully see that tree is probably done. I think that tree is probably done. A little bit of soft color here and there on the edges with more water and uh, on that tree. And I think that tree is maybe a few little bits of uh, dark in here and a little, few little bits in, in there but some some kind of watery mixtures and and just the impression of uh, of, of leaves I think that's not bad for a spring tree that's not too overpowered with a massive amount of leaves. So these trees will be done in the same way. And then the other two cows will be done in the same way. And then we'll see whether there needs to be any other details added um, to the process. It's just a slow, careful, process like here I'll take put some of uh, the watery wash and then come in with a little more some dots in that and let them let them bleed around in the in there and diffuse you see just like that just let them so that there's the a feeling of leaves there and then you can dry you can wipe your brush and diffuse some areas with a damp brush but basically you just want to indicate that there's a, a group of leaves there by a group of a kind of bit of color and then put some others and I'm making this a little bit different than the other tree 
assuming that it's a different tree and its leaves should be a little different. So some places more de definition of leaves like this and then in other places more more soft color. So from so vary it. Don't do it all the same thing in each location, you know? So a little bit of soft color here and there, and but leave some of the sky showing through. And then a little bit of leaf definition in that wash of soft color. And that should be enough to indicate what's going on there. Okay. And some of those leaves will be outside of the color with the, the mass of color and kind of standing by themselves here and there. Okay. It's not perfect, but um, if you're not happy with something, you can just dab it with your paper towel and say that there's a little too much paint there on that. Okay. So that's the process, and um, after uh, maybe an hour or so of that process, and the same with the cows, so then we'll come back and see if there are any more finishing touches to be done. Take care. Thanks for joining me. Well, I'm back for a little bit more detailing on these, um, on the grasses. I just wanted to show you how I did I take some dry a dry brush and a, a semi wet mixture of paint and do on the side some dry brushing to get texture into the uh, grasses without actually drawing a lot of grasses. Okay, you see how that's done? I think that you can get a sense of that. And I used um, a variety of colors. I used a, a warm green, and now this is a little darker cool green, and um, a little bit of um, ochre in there to lighten up some of the colors. So this is just a very dry brush dipped into a mixture that is has very little water in it and uh, just enough for me to get some paint on the brush and then and I'm using a flat brush a quarter inch flat brush is a good size for doing this leaving enough light around the cow that we can see the dimensions of its head and leaving some parts of the grass lighter than other parts. I'm going to do the same thing, taking a little bit of that ochre um, color and um, putting, showing you just, actually this is a raw sienna. I'll do, I'll do it with a raw sienna. It's a little bit more earthy looking. quite similar to a yellow ochre, but just a, a little less bright yellow. And I'm doing the same thing with some of the raw sienna up here in the warmer area of the grass where the sun is clearly hitting. So put a little bit of that in these warm areas. And even up in the hillside here where there's some, some warmth, I put a little highlight with the raw sienna in there. Okay. Now, um, in terms of having a little more detail, this is my palette with the earth colors, the yellows and the browns, versus the palette with the blues and the greens. 
So I have two um, rigger brushes here, both about the same size. Um, the size is a zero. And I'm going to put a fairly emerald type of green on one brush. And I'll go with a, a yellow ochre on the other brush. Let me just turn that around. You might be able to see the two colors then. Okay. So I've got this, um, this is my yellow, oh, sorry. This is my yellow ochre in here. Okay, my yellow ochre in here, you can see the color. And my, um, and I'll just clean that bit of green that I put on the, the paint there. Just take a paper towel, rub the top of that blob of paint. So, making a fairly dense amount of color, very little water, well, mostly pigment, strong pigment. I'm going to put that in there with that rigor brush. Over here, I'm going to take this um, brighter green, but I'm going to have to mix it with a darker green as well, the Prussian green, because it's too bright. So I've got some of that some of that color here. And what I'm going to do is um, put some grass marks in, just here and there, in this foreground area, with the rigor, some calligraphic marks with the rigor to have a little bit of more sense of grass. Okay, I'm going to put some of those marks in, in the yellow ochre. And side by side with those, I'm going to put some of the marks in with the, the intense green combination of Prussian and emerald green or Viridian green. And that will give me a little more, just a little here and there, not too much in some of those grasses. I have to use the two colors because I want a little bit lighter and brighter to show, but at the same time, I need the definition created by the darker. And in some areas they'll mix together because I'm doing them side by side, both wet, so the colors will mix together and neither one will be so bright. They'll be more true to nature by being mixed, but they're mixing on the paper. So I just want a few grasses here and there, in here. And I just wanted to show you that I'll do some of that detail. I'm still working on the leaves in the background. As uh, we had discussed before, and the leaves are just done with some various greens, uh, putting in, I think you can see, I'll move this over here, I'm putting in some color that is some areas of color. And then I can even use the same rigor or a smaller brush, just a smaller brush, to put in some individual leaves. A bit dry, not too wet, because I put down some wet, soft color without any definition, and now I'm putting a little bit of definition on top of that. So you can see the, the, that there's more, leave, more leaves, more grass, more um, mass, but you're not trying to put in all the leaves, okay? 
So that's the way the leaves will be finished in this whole sky area with the sky, which was deliberately left very, very light. Um, the sky shining through the um, thing, and then we'll just finish up with this cow. Okay, that'll be how we uh, complete this, and I'll come back to you later. Well, I've um, put in marks with um, dry brush and also some of the calligraphic marks with the rigger. Now I'm just going to take a mixture of some white and I think you can see that mixture, yes, some, some white and some of that yellow ochre to get it light. Uh, they're both semi-transparent, so neither are fully opaque. And I make it wet enough that I can put my toothbrush, my soft tooth, toothbrush from a hotel I stayed in. And um, add some white speckles in here because there'd always be some bits of like seeds on the grasses. So I just want to have a little bit of that. In some places. So we have the dry brush, a little bit of speckling, um, sometimes a little bit of speckling with some red is nice because there are always a few little like clover flowers red clover flowers and red and do the same with that because this is just to create the impression of what is out there so I'll take a red any red but probably a um, a scarlet would be best, so it would show up. Take that scarlet, put it in that same white mixture that had some ochre in it, doesn't really matter. That's a nice clover color actually. Put a little more red in it. Okay, I'll take that color and then use the toothbrush again and put, I think you can see the color, yes, okay. So I'll take the color, wipe my toothbrush in it, and get some red in there, in patches here and there. To give the feeling of some clover flowers. And then the only thing that's left is to finish these, gra these leaves. And the uh, cow here, the cow is fairly straightforward. I'll just do that quick for you now. Um, it's like painting snow. You approach it in the same way. You just put in some shadow. I've changed the markings of the cow from what my photograph was because I wanted to have more white in the cow and I could see it more clearly. So you just put in some shadow initially, which I have already done in a soft, um, creamy yellow in a few places, like there, and a little bit of cobalt blue, the same as the other cows in some places. So I'll put in a little bit just to show you a little bit more like here, a little bit of cobalt blue, a shadow around the belly. That's too much. I'll water that down. A little bit of cobalt blue here on the leg. Okay. And a little bit around the nostrils and the face. And so the rest is fairly straightforward. Take a, either a thin black or a Payne's Gray, doesn't matter. Um, 
but get it soft enough so it's not too dark and put in some of those markings, make them up. Um, I could make them up as I go. Doesn't really matter. I get to decide where the cow has the markings based on the needs of the painting. So I'll put a little marking, a little marking here on the cow. some marking on the back of the cow where it has a ridge this one and then up a bit into the side I'm going to leave some of this white I'll put another marking on this leg underneath down into the belly area. Show that. I'm choosing making my markings to kind of leave some white in areas. And to have a little bit of here negative painting around the face. Like I said, this was a mostly, uh, the photo of this cow was a mostly black with just a few little white markings on the head. And I felt like I needed a little bit more um, definition on that cow. So I'm changing and putting more white on the cow. So I'm using the, the markings to provide some definition in some areas where I really want it. Hopefully that will work. Put some here on its, on its rump. Now I'm dropping in a little more deeper color in some areas. The, the black will be reflecting some sunlight so it's okay that um, some areas are a little lighter than others. I'm going to make this come out a little further here and reach down a little further here. And that then gives some shape to the leg. Put some here. And um, define the belly in area a little bit by just the shadow within the black. Intensify this around the face. And then I'm going to have some here on, on its ears to define the ears. little bit on the face. A little bit of markings down on the face. Yeah, I think that'll probably and then a little bit of shadowing on the edges here. And then we begin to have a cow. And um, I think all we'll need is just the two eyes. So I'll just show those two eyes with a fine small pen, small brush, and the nostrils. And that is probably maybe a little more of a spot going around from this area, that would be okay too. A little bit of an edge here, a little bit of an edge here. 
rump comes up. Looks like a very fat cow. Hopefully that's not too fat, but uh, a little center, a little shadow in the center of the ear here. A little more definition of the ear there. A little more negative painting around the head to make the head a little thinner. And I think that probably that'll be enough to make that visually seem, hopefully, like a cow. So there we are. I can always do a little more shadow on the face, get a little more shape in the face that would be shadow rather than so if I add more water, make it very light, shadow under the face, and a little bit of shadow inside the ear. I think that we just want to give the impression of this more distant cow, and that would probably be okay. You may need that face to be a little thinner. The face is a little too thick. So you just keep tweaking it and standing back, taking a look and saying, hmm, does that seem okay? Let's, let's make that face a little thinner still. Yeah, that is starting to look a little bit more like a cow. And not just a black and white balloon. And we've got the cow's legs coming down straight here, so that as if the leg is out a little bit there, that kind of makes it look less round. Okay, probably good enough. And then the only thing left are some more of these leaves. This painting is basically uh, done. I'll just zoom out a little bit. I'll zoom out and say, for the most part, this, uh, let's see if I can just zoom out a little more. There. Get the camera in the right position and say, okay, for the most part, this painting is done. Yeah. It's just going to need some more of these kind of soft washes, soft, soft wet blobs of greens, different greens, and then a little bit of marking on top uh, with a little more color that has less water. So um, a little finer brush like a, um, a number one or two and maybe you can use a six, six to make the softer uh, groupings of leaves and use the um, one or two to make the, a few fine points. And um, that's probably enough for this painting to be called done. Thanks for joining me. I hope you enjoyed the process and um, can use some of the techniques to create your own painting. Take care. Okay, I'm almost done with the um, leaves. I've, you can see that I've just put some basic color. I'll just give you one example. Just taken some some different greens. This is like a bluish green. This is a little more warm, more yellow green. But I, I've just taken, made some greens, made a very light wash, and put some color in there. And now I'm going with a, that's all dried, and so now I'm just going with a, a fine, small brush and putting in some, some marks to indicate individual leaves. Nothing, nothing precise. And then I'll just show you the other step that I do to finish this up 
and then you will see how the painting was completely finished. So I'm just trying to make some darker greens so it'll show up against the light mass of greens that have been kind of positioned around between the branches in various places. And what doesn't, it doesn't matter so much the actual uh, hue of the green. Um, it's, whether it's bluish green or yellowish green, because what I'm looking for now is the value contrast between a little darker, a little darker green showing up against the, the light washes that I put in here and there. Now I'm going with just a little bit darker in a few places, you see, for contrast. Not being at all fussy about the exact green. I mean, I could even put in some more bluish greens, and maybe some will be in front of the tree there. Some might be, so there'll be some branches obscured here and there. And I can put some of this over here where I've already finished, but it's all right. Do a little more, <clears throat> a little more contrast and dark in some of these areas and also create some harmony between these few trees over here, oh, which you can't see, these few trees over here, and the others. Now these trees over here are pretty much done. So I'm just um, focusing on these, these trees on the left and in the middle. Okay, so That's beginning to be more than enough detail. I don't want to overdo it. But the next thing I'm going to do is the finishing point where I take a, oops, nothing like dropping my paintbrushes on the floor. So I took some very, um, blue, I put, took some blue and a dark green and a little vibrant green. So I have some Prussian green in here and some cobalt or cerulean blue in here. Okay, I'll even put a little bit of red in here for contrast. Okay, so I've got a really nice intense green because I'm going to use it I want it to be intense because I'm going to use it for making tiny little splatter marks so let's see my favorite toothbrush from the Kaminsky Hotel so I'm just going to take my toothbrush like this and create some splatter. And all that matters is that it's in the green family. It's a little darker. You can see it. So the red helps also just differentiate a little bit, make it a little darker. So that is pretty much all I need to do on these trees. I can do some areas a little more intense with this splatter. It's like in the center of some masses like here. You can do it a little more intense, a little more marks. <clears throat> and from my point of view, now this painting is officially finished. I'll zoom out a little bit so you can see the whole of it. And that is, is, um, is it. I think you can see the whole thing now. Great. I hope you like it. Thank you for joining me.